Shine3.com. I'm here with Mark Venture, CEO and President of Game Recruiter. How are you doing today, Mark? I'm doing awesome. Thanks, Charles. How about yourself? I'm doing wonderful. I'm very excited to be here to interview today. We appreciate your time and look forward to hearing all the things you have to say and share with our users. So, I'd first like to start off with a question um, relating to your experience and how you got into the industry. So. How did you get first started in the video game development industry? Well, I had an unusual beginning uh, in our industry. I got a degree as a game as a programmer, and my first job was working for a robotics company. It was Cincinnati Millicron. Uh, Cincinnati Millicron made robots uh, that you see in the auto uh, manufacturing plants, and I was lucky enough to get into their research and development group. Uh, we were working on new artificial intelligence uh, techniques for the robots. Uh, so I got to spend a lot of time at Carnegie Mellon University, their Robotics Institute, uh, as a result of that. And you know, at nighttime, um, they'd, uh, the students uh, working at CMU would uh, take over the computer, or the mainframe uh, at the university. I'm sure the university uh, faculty wouldn't have been so appreciative of it <laughs> if they knew that. And uh, for the first time, I saw a video game. Uh, and that was uh, what we know today as Asteroids. Uh, and it was networked and we were wor working on old-fashioned Apollo machines and PDP-11s. It was uh, quite, uh, you know, uh, 1980s. And, um, but I really realized in that moment that I was in the wrong industry. So I quit my job at Cincinnati Millicron, moved myself to uh, the San Francisco Bay Area, and volunteered my body to work at a company called Sphere, which later became uh, Spectrum Holobyte. Um, when did you first start playing games, and what are some of your all-time favorite games? I started playing games 28 years ago. Wow, long time ago. Mm -hmm. You know, and back then, games were basically regulated to arcades. Uh, there were very few uh, home systems or rudimentary systems, uh, like the Atari 2600, the Magnavox uh, system. So we really were looking at 8-bit, 10-bit systems at the time. So that's what uh, those were the games that I started playing. Uh, and it never stopped, so it's been uh, quite a long time. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's a great, uh, interesting background you have with the robotics and how you first initially got into the gaming industry. How did you get into the recruiting side of the gaming industry? Well, I was lucky enough, of course, to join the industry when it was very young, and uh, folks then were considered freaks and geeks who would work in our mm -hmm. space, and uh, here I had a degree, uh, and because of that, I was able to get promoted pretty quickly. So before I knew it, I was an engineering manager running teams. Uh, so of course I had to manage people, and of course I had to hire people. Uh, so that's when I began the process of uh, learning and teaching myself really uh, how to find uh, and hire, hire folks. Uh, by the time I left Spectrum Holobyte, uh, I had a good 200 hires under my belt. So, uh, so the, really that's uh, what began the process. And then from uh, Spectrum, I went to uh, the 3DO company, which was Trip Hawkins' second uh, ga you know, game entity. His first one was, he was one of the original founders of Electronic Arts, and 3DO was his uh, second uh, game company. Uh, that company made cons a console system and, of course, a software. And I was brought on board to be uh, a technical producer to work mm -hmm. on a game called Twisted. But day two of my job, Trip walked into the office and said, you know, Mark, I hear you know how to hire and we need a good 300 people for 3DO Studio. So my job changed quickly from technical producer to recruiter again, and uh, I brought in a good, good 300 folks to 3DO Studio. And so um, you mentioned before that you were a programmer prior to being uh, recruiting focused. Um, how did you learn that from, I know you're self-taught, how did you teach yourself the tools um, to, to learn programming? Well, of course, uh, the college degree I had gave me the basics uh, of learning how to program. And like with any degree, it, that's just a foundation. You just need to build upon it. So back then, you know, 27 years ago in our industry, it was quite, we were quite young. So uh, coming on board, it was just learning on the fly. So taking the core skills that I learned, you know, in college and then applying those, you know, you know in my job on a daily basis as we were just kind of going. So, and that's how I, I started to learn. You know, we were at that point working on DOS and Windows 1.0. Wow. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, you know, it was really learning, uh, of course, how to, uh, to deal with that. DOS was easy, that was taught in school, but Windows was brand new at the time. So it was about learning Windows and how to get around that operating system. Because of course, then they didn't have a game SDK like they do today. 
uh, it's not wasn't as robust of a product as it is today. So it was learning about how to code around that so that the games worked through it and rocked. Yeah. Yeah. So we all know you're a very busy man as a CEO of a, of a game recruiter. Um, how do you stay on track and manage your time? Do you have any advice you could give to people just beginning their careers in, um, in industry? Sure, that's a big challenge. And I think uh, staying on time and staying on track is a challenge for anyone in any job that they're in. I find that what I must do is schedule my day. So for instance, uh, when I begin work in the morning, that first hour and a half, I am answering emails. Then I go to log on to my social uh, accounts, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, things like that, to deal with what's going on there. And then after an hour and a half, two hours of that, I end that process and then I begin my work day. You know, uh, work through my work day, and then I end my work day again by logging on to the social sites, and then, of course, planning my uh, the next day's at work activities. Very important to kind of pre-plan ahead what I'm going to do. So I'm really uh, on a schedule, and I do my best to stay on that schedule. And that's the only way I have learned and figured out how to actually accomplish what I need to accomplish in a day. You know. <laughs> well, that's that's really great advice. Um, so more on in the vein of advice, um, what's a common mistake you see from people? as they're trying to get jobs in the industry? Some of the most common mistakes I see uh, with job hunters trying to get into the industry is number one, a generic resume that they blast out to the world. You know, that's like playing the lottery. You must customize your resume and customize your demo to the game company you're approaching. You know, Electronic Arts, their sports group, doesn't really give a rat's ass about your science fiction art if you're applying for an art job. So, you know, you really need to tailor and customize the demo and what you're showing of folks and the resume and what you're, you know, what you're showing, you know, per your target company. Uh, another problem that I see often is that people uh, tend to write a resume that is functional oriented. They describe the function of a producer, the function of an artist. They don't talk about their accomplishments. And what we're looking for in the industry is what can you do? What can you bring to the table? So of course we want a resume that's, that, that focuses on your accomplishments. Another common mistake that people do is they give up control of their job search to somebody else. Really, you're the one who needs to run your job search and be in control of that. You need to know where your resume is, who's got your resume, and of course what companies have it or don't have it. So uh, a lot of people give up control of their job hunt by relying on the human resources department of a company relying on an online job service of some sort, a job board, uh, or relying on external recruiters or third-party recruiters like myself to do the job hunt for you. And these are tools to assist you, but they are not uh, what should take over your job search. You are the one who needs to be driving you know, that job search process. That's another mistake that I find that's quite common you know, amongst folks as they're, as they're doing their job search. Another mistake that I see uh, people make is um, they assume that the reader of the resume knows anything about the game industry. Really when you create a resume, you're creating a resume for two audiences, someone who knows nothing about the resume but may be routing your resume out for the job, and then of course the hiring manager who's reading the resume. So you have to keep that in mind uh, when you're doing two things. Another thing I've noticed quite a bit is people who use the wrong file format when they're approaching a company. We have to remember that uh, this is uh, 2011, almost 2012, and humans are no longer reading resumes. We have computers doing that. So really important to submit your resume in the proper file format that is readable by a computer. Otherwise, the information off your resume is not going to be parsed correctly. Thus, the file in human resources is not going to be correct. Thus, you're not going to be coming up for jobs every time the, uh, every time the hiring manager or HR queries the database uh, for certain skills, it's just not going to happen. So PDF files are really death to people's searches, to a job search, uh, because a PDF file is a vector file, and vector file is an image, and images cannot easily be read by a computer. So I really encourage people to stay simple, simple, you know, an RTF file, a DOC file, a TXT file, uh, forget the fancy fonts, forget the, the fancy columns, forget all of that. It's a really basic and simple, boring resume. No art images in the resume at all. That's what your online demo is for. And by the way, everyone in our industry needs a demo. I don't care if you're an artist, a game designer, a programmer, marketing, business development, producer, 
We all need a demo to get a job in this industry, and that demo must be online. It must be simple to navigate. It must tell the story quickly because no one is going to spend five minutes on your, you know, on your online demo. So you need to really communicate in a concise form, not only in written on your resume, but also on the website. So are certain parts of the country better than others for this business? You know, there, there tend to be hubs in North America. So uh, of course, Los Angeles number one, San Francisco, Seattle, Washington, Vancouver, Austin, Texas, Boston, Toronto, Montreal, San Diego, Washington, D.C., uh, New York, Dallas, Atlanta, and most recently Salt Lake City. And I've kind of listed those in the area, uh, in the, the level of how deep they are in game companies. So that tends to be where the hubs are in, in the industry. Of course, you're going to find a game company in almost every location in the United States, in North America, but these are where the hubs tend to be located. Do you find uh, that you are relocating people frequently then to these hubs? Yes, or? yes. I definitely are We're doing a lot of relocation to these hubs and I do advise when someone is looking for a job that they put themselves in an area where there are more companies. Why would you be in Iowa with a one game company place? Because when that if that game company goes out of business or you leave that company, you must move. So why not establish yourself in, in Los Angeles, in San Francisco, in Seattle, in Austin, Texas, in these high areas so that uh, when you do your job hunt again, you don't have to uproot yourself, your family, and your entire life. So I'm always recommending that you choose one of the, one of the hubs. What are the top three things students interested in pursuing a career in the gaming industry should be thinking about right now, today, what they can do? Okay, the uh, top three things that students can do is first of all, they need to create a database. They need to get a database, learn the database. I don't care if it's ACT, FileMaker Pro, whatever works for you. Uh, you want to network, network, network. People in our industry hire who they know. And people, uh, so, and our industry is small and incestuous, even though it's quite large. We still all know each other. So uh, it's very important for you to create a database Fill that database up with folks that you meet, network, 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 because really what you want to do is you want to access the unadvertised job market. You know, only 10% of the jobs are advertised, and that's the easy, low-hanging fruit. And so the lazy job hunter is, is answering those job ads. That's not job hunting. You know, so what happens is Electronic Arts, for instance, they have an animator job, they'll post it on seven sites, and per week they get about three to 5,000 resumes you know, for that same job. Now, you don't even know if the job is real. Sometimes they advertise a job because they need to for legal requirements. But, you know, there's many reasons why a job could be advertised. Um, and why would you also want to be one of 7,000 people when you can be one, when you can be your own person, when you can be someone who stands out? So really through networking and knowing other folks in the industry is when you become open to and aware of the unadvertised job market. And that's really where you're going to get your ground and where you're going to find the job. In, in addition to networking, um, do you have any other tips for people to get into the an advertising job market? Yes. I, uh, you must have a demo. I recommend that you establish yourself a, a permanent email address, permanent email address, and a permanent phone number. No matter where you move in the country, no matter what it is, I have the same phone number, the same email address, the same website address for the last 20 years. If you can't find me, you are just don't know how to use the internet. And that's the way it should be for you as well, for anyone. You know, you really need to be able to network, know people, and be contactable. Even if you haven't talked to that person for 10, 15 years, they should be able to find you because, of course, you want that unadvertised job, and that's the way that's going to happen. So, you know, when you're not job hunting, you're networking. And you're, you know, that, 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 that process never stops. Mm -hmm. You know, in this day and age, we don't have the luxury anymore like our grandparents did of working for a company for 20 or 30 years. And plus, we're in a high-tech industry. And because of the volatility in high-tech, companies open and close all the time. So you really need to be networking constantly, even when you're not job hunting, because, of course, that's how you're going to maintain your career and your credibility, you know, in, in the industry. Um, is there any other advice you'd like to give people who want to get started in the video game development industry? You know, the other thing I would recommend is that you become an expert and start to write about things. 
write about animation topics. You know, uh, there's a new movement now from pixels to molecules. Wow, what does that mean? You know, and start to write about that, start to talk about that. Uh, in programming, there are new techniques coming up all the time. So to, to talk about those new techniques, you're learning about them in school, for example, or you're learning about them in real life, teach other people. So it's about getting out there and getting known and establishing reputation for yourself. And you know, that's a very important thing to do. So writing articles, speaking at conferences, you know, you know, getting yourself out there so that uh, you know, you're known and contactable. In your opinion, what does the future of gaming look like? I'm really excited about the future of gaming. We're already starting to see a blur between the digital world and the real world. Uh, some of my clients right now are working on games where the actual the avatar inside the game turns on a television and the TV in the real world turns on or picks up the phone in the game and my phone rings and they start talking to me on my phone. Wow, so that's quite amazing. We're also going to see much more immersive experiences where sight, sound, smell, touch come into play. Really, uh, much like in Star Trek, the holodeck that they used to have. And we're going to be able to choose our own experiences uh, that we have going on. So, so I'm really excited to see these things come down the pike. The Army and the Air Force are already experimenting and have these programs are going on actively right now. So, uh, so that will filter down into general population eventually. But these things are happening you know, as we speak. And of course, that's where, that's where the future is headed. So one, one last question that we like to ask everyone we interview. Um, if you had to sum up video game design slash development in one word, what would it be? Uh, one word is really tough, but <laughs> I would say awesome and exciting. This industry is just, just rocks. I love it. It's my life. Uh, anyone who is uh, involved in the game space that I meet is, you know, feels the same way. So uh, awesome and exciting would be my words, and I guess that's not one word, is it? <laughs> <laughs> we'll take it. <laughs> Thank you for your time, Mark. You're welcome, Chelsea. It's been great.